Evening, everybody, for another uh, welcome to another weekly um, University of Miami symposium on cerebrovascular and skull based topics. Uh, delighted to be introducing uh, this week's uh, seminar here. Uh, this is now session number 24 for us on Thursdays, uh, on this October 29th. Um, I'm Jacques Morcos, professor and co-chair of the Department of Neurosurgery and director of Cerebrovascular and Skull Base. Uh, my great pleasure, as I do every week, to have the co-directors of this course uh, with us. Uh, Carolina Benjamin, assistant professor, my partner here. She directs our Keynes Dissection Lab and she specializes in brain tumor and skull-based surgery, as well as works at, in addition to the University of Miami Jackson North Hospital. Mike Ivan, Assistant Professor, Department of Neurosurgery, uh, UM uh, Director of Research at the University of Miami Brain Tumor Initiative. Uh, Mike uh, does brain tumors, skull-based surgery, as well as epilepsy surgery, as well as my uh, two endovascular, open vascular colleagues, Bobby Stark, and Eric Peterson. So it's been great several months doing these things. Of course, we're talking to you from uh, Miami and uh, our this is our medical complex. Our two main hospitals are University of Miami Hospital and Jackson Memorial Hospital. Some housekeeping instructions. Those of you who are new to this uh, today, uh, there is a Q&A box in your Zoom window. Please, uh, type your questions throughout the seminar. We will collect them and we will discuss them at the end. We don't offer CMEs. Please let your colleagues and friends know on social media whether you enjoy this. Um, our two speakers tonight will each speak for 25 minutes. I may or may not need to give them a two minute warning before the end uh, so that the three panelists will talk to us after that. Uh, this is uh, where we are in the list of various lectures that we've done. And you can see where we are coming with this next week. I'll show you again. And this we're going to carry on through December 17. And most likely after December 17, we will do this monthly instead of weekly since uh, we're hoping that life is kind of coming back to normal for most of us, even though it's going to drag for the COVID situation is going to drag clearly many, many months to come. Um, next week, please join us for a great skull-based session. We'll have uh, Fred Gentili and Luigi Cavallo talk, uh, from uh, Naples, Italy. Fred from Toronto, University of Toronto, to talk about uh, recurrent giant pituitary adenomas as well as anterior skull-based meningioma. And we have three spectacular panelists, Mike Shacoin from WashU. We have Philip Theodosopoulos from UCSF and my own rhinology partner, Corina Levin here, University of Miami. Every Wednesday, many of you already know, my partner, Mike Ivan, uh, uh, directs a fantastic symposium on uh, called the Miami Global Brain Tumor Symposium. And next Wednesday will be Mike uh, Chagru, who is going to be talking to us uh, on uh, uh, glioma connectomics from uh, Australia, Sydney, Australia, where he's relo relocated a couple of years ago with Charlie Teo. Many thanks to the team that makes these webinars happen, particularly uh, Roberto and Ignacio here, who's running the show, Christina and Ingrid. Uh, various uh, links if you would like to connect with our department here of neurosurgery and University of Miami, with our training department, with me personally, with our departmental Instagram or Twitter. And the box in yellow is where you can see the, all the previous sessions that have been recorded and we recorded all of them. They're there for free viewing by anybody who's interested in, if you've missed several. So uh, I'd like to introduce very briefly our partner, uh, our panelists. Uh, first, Judy Wong, Professor and Vice Chair, Department of Neurosurgery at Johns Hopkins. She's Program Director 
director of the CV Fellowship. She also is currently director of the AB, uh, in the AB, ABNS American Board of Neurosurgery. She is vice chair of the joint CV section. And of course, Judy is a cerebrovascular expert, and I'm delighted she's made the time to join us today. Uh, next is uh, Babak Jahromi, who is professor, Department of Neurosurgery, vice chair of regional neurosurgery at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. I've known Babak since his fellowship days here at the University of Miami when he did an endovascular fellowship with Ali Sultan. Uh, and uh, I've uh, got to appreciate what he's done over the years. And uh, thank you, Babak, for for doing this and joining us. And of course, Babak is duly trained in endovascular and open vascular. And last but not least, Adel Malik, my compatriot from Lebanon, but uh, really professor at uh, Tuft Chief of Cerebrovascular, duly trained cerebrovascular. Uh, and Adel has done tremendous work, particularly in the endovascular field on uh, stents and flow diverters and so forth. And again, I'd love the expertise of our three panelists today to discuss with our two speakers the various topics of wide neck aneurysms. Which brings me to our two speakers. I'll start with Felipe. F uh, Felipe is an Evi and Lou Grubb Professor of Neurovascular Research, Director of Endovascular Neurosurgery at the BNI in Phoenix. Uh, again, this is not really meant to, to list all everybody's accomplishment, just a snippet of what they've done for the field. Uh, Felipe is past chair of the SNES annual meeting, he's past vice chair of the joint CV section, and the very important job he's doing currently, uh, he's doing a fantastic job with it, is editor of uh, prob th probably the best uh, endovascular journal, JNIS, uh, a prolific writer of more than 410 papers. Uh, next is Sander Connolly, Bennett Stein professor and chair, recently chair of his department after having spent his entire career in Colombia. And uh, now he is the chair and will take it to new heights following Bob Solomon's contributions over the years, of course, uh, has trained numerous cerebrovascular and non-cerebrovascular residents who've gone on to produce great things due to his, due to Sander Connolly's uh, legendary lab. He, of course, is past president of the NSA, the Sun, uh, past chair of the Joint CV section, past director of the ABNS, uh, and the editor-in-chief of operative neurosurgery, also a prolific writer of more than 600 papers in the field. So I'm going to stop chattering and talking, and I am going to stop sharing my slides. And again, now I invite Felipe to share his slides, unmute his microphone, and talk to us for 25 minutes about endovascular treatments of wide neck aneurysms. Following that, Sander will discuss the microsurgical aspects of wide neck aneurysms. Thank you. Thank you, Jacques. And I uh, just want to congratulate you on this uh, continuing webinar series. You've really become, I think, the Johnny Carson of neurosurgical webinars. Uh, Without the humor. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the humor and the charisma are certainly there, and I appreciate the, the work that you and your team have done. Thanks. Um, I'll, I'll discuss today some of um, my personal endovascular strategies and review some of the novel devices that are used to treat this really complex subgroup uh, of aneurysms as we know. I have no relevant discussions that are pertinent to, um, uh, to today's discussion. Really over the last 15 years, there's been an incredible technical evolution in endovascular neurosurgery in terms of the treatment of these lesions. We know that these lesions are particularly vexing uh, mostly to patients, but certainly to us as well in terms of our ability to control them uh, and to cure them. Uh, we've used from the beginning techniques such as balloon remodeling and stent-assisted coil embolization. 
uh, after the development of stents that uh, were navigable in the intracranial circulation, we began to develop techniques to use these stents a bit more creatively in different designs, such as Y stenting, X stenting, and T stenting, where we actually navigate one stent through the side wall of another into a Y or X configuration, or a butt one stent to the side of another in a T configuration. Other techniques that we've developed over time are the waffle cone technique in which a stent is deployed partially into the ostium of an aneurysm and serves as a buttress for coil embolization. Some techniques obviously have fallen out of favor over time. And one of those has been the use of liquid embolic agents with balloon protection. Uh, and certainly we've seen now the advent of very powerful technology, and I'm speaking specifically of flow diversion, which really has revolutionized our ability to treat some of these very complicated lesions. Though this technique is uh, hindered by some complicating factors such as tortuous anatomy, our ability to navigate these devices, which are relatively stiff to their target location, and certainly potential complications associated with the use of adjuvant medications. There are a number of different uh, neck remodeling devices, uh, such as the Pulse Rider and P-Conus devices, which uh, I will discuss as well briefly. And recently, the advent of intrasacular devices, such as the Web device, the Luna device, the Contour device, have now given us a new armamentarium for dealing with these lesions. Neck bridging stents are another type of uh, adjuvant therapy for these types of lesions. So in terms of bifurcation aneurysms, and what I've done here is separated these lesions into bifurcation type aneurysms and sidewall aneurysms. And I'll discuss some of the technical advances and some of my strategies for dealing with these lesions. As I mentioned, there are a number of different creative strategies for treating these with X and Y and T stenting. The, virtually the, the, the whole alphabet can be, can be contoured into a stent if you try hard enough. Uh, stent-assisted coiling, where you just place a single stent and then coil through the stent, remains a tried and true endovascular technique. And there are a number of different stents now that have evolved uh, to the point where we're able to navigate them into the distal circulation. And certainly more complex techniques such as transcirculation uh, catheterization where we're navigating from the anterior to the posterior circulation or from one vertebral circulation to the other are important to have uh, in our arm inventarium to deal with these types of lesions. As I mentioned earlier, flow diversion has revolutionized our ability to treat complex wide-necked aneurysms as has intrasacular devices. Why stenting to this day remains a viable technique and, and basically this is a technique in which uh, generally an open cell design stent is placed in one arm uh, at the bifurcation and a closed cell stent is placed in the other arm a catheter is navigated through that stent construct and then coil embolization is performed. You can see in this particular uh, picture, we've placed a stent into the right PCA, a stent here into the left PCA. We have our catheter in place and coil embolization has been performed. This technique, while attractive and, and uh, effective in the early stage, uh, really has proven to be somewhat um, uh, problematic in the long term. We've seen uh, a, a significant amount of recanalization, coil compaction with these wide neck aneurysms. Y stenting uh, really at this point does not um, create enough of a barrier to prevent uh, recanalization of these aneurysms. Um, transcirculation techniques, as I mentioned, remain an important um, means of addressing these lesions. There are, often we can't get to these lesions through one route. We have to find another one. In this case, uh, this is a 54-year-old man with TIAs, this large aneurysm discovered essentially incidentally. I don't think it had any relation to his TIAs but he has a very large PCOM uh, artery here, as you can see. 
And this was our route to the aneurysm coming across the PECOM and across the basilar apex. If you look closely on this uh, fluoroscopic image, you can see a rough outline of the aneurysm here, probably partially calcified. Uh, I'll draw it out for you a little bit better. Our plan was to come from the right PECOM. We have a catheter here in the right internal carotid artery, a catheter below the screen here in the left vertebral artery. We've navigated a catheter superiorly into the dome of the aneurysm. We've come across the PECOM, across the neck of the aneurysm, placed a stent there and coil embolized the aneurysm. These techniques, I think, remain vital in the treatment of complex aneurysms. There's our stent construct in place, beautiful initial uh, result here. But as I mentioned earlier, this type of construct, I think really is prone to recanalization and compaction uh, of the aneurysm, especially in these larger lesions. We can perform transcirculation embolization to deposit a balloon across the neck of the aneurysm. And this becomes more important in the setting of subarachnoid hemorrhage where our use of dual antiplatelet agents can be problematic in terms of a patient's uh, hemorrhagic risk, uh, especially in the setting of um, an external ventricular drain or a need for concomitant surgery, such as ventricular peritoneal shunting. Here we navigate a catheter into the aneurysm, come across the PECOM, inflate a balloon across the neck of the aneurysm and coil the aneurysm. Here with a Raymond II result, certainly sufficient to protect the patient in the initial phases uh, after subarachnoid hemorrhage. Wide-necked bifurcation aneurysms are certainly a challenge, and I think they're a challenge for a number of different reasons. One is that there are markedly different treatment regimens. There are markedly different uh, aneurysm uh, anatomical configurations, and there really is no standard treatment for these lesions, whether it be uh, uh, treatments through interventional routes or through microsurgery. And that really makes it virtually impossible to establish a control arm as a comparator. And at least in the endovascular realm, that limits most of our knowledge of these devices to single arm evaluation. We know that historically, the uh, results have been relatively mediocre in terms of our ability to close these aneurysms successfully with a Ramon uh, Roy uh, score of one uh, occurring really only in about 28 to 40%. And I uh, would recommend reading the reviews by Fiorella and Delisi that uh, specifically address this subject. Flow diversion can be used in, in the setting of wide neck bifurcation aneurysms as well. The flow diverter is a, a, an incredible uh, device in terms of deflecting coils uh, away from the parent artery. It really is truly the definition of stent supported embolization. We see that here in this case of a 62 year old woman with vertigo, large basilar apex aneurysm, diminutive right PCA, but this illustrates some of the technical challenges of using this device uh, and of these devices and, and some of its drawbacks. Uh, attempting to navigate the catheter into the left PCA was challenging because of the wide neck nature. Uh, the catheter herniated, as you can see here, uh, continuously into the aneurysm itself. Here we navigated across the dome of the aneurysm and attempted to pull this loop back. We were unable to do that. So in this setting, you have to have somewhat creative uh, techniques in order to uh, successfully treat the aneurysm. We've jailed a catheter, as you can see, near the dome. Um, and in order to pull this loop out, what we did is, is created a grappling hook. We deployed a stent retriever in the left P2 segment unsheath the stent retriever that serves as a grappling hook, enabling us then to pull the catheter system down and out of the dome of the aneurysm, and then subsequently to deposit the pipeline embolization device in this case, and then coil occlude uh, the aneurysm uh, separately. When we looked at our wide necked ruptured aneurysms in the BRAT trial, uh, we saw, as, as you can imagine, uh, the, you know, the worst 
outcomes at all out at all time points as, as we expected and uh, as we've come to expect with these lesions. Uh, we use the standard definition for defining these lesions. Justin Mascatelli uh, put together our series a few years back. We had 177 patients who had wide-necked cerebral aneurysms in the brat. These were typically of the MCA, basilar, and internal carotid artery. As I mentioned, these patients generally had worse outcomes at all time points. Coiling in this particular setting was associated with a lower uh, obliteration rate and higher recurrence rate, uh, though the clinical outcomes for both arms of treatment were equivalent. This study, when we're talking about wide-necked aneurysms now, is um, a bit difficult to compare to what we're discussing uh, because this was a post hoc uh, analysis. There was substantial crossover to clipping, and what we were dealing with really was just ruptured aneurysms in which we were coiling. We weren't really using, using adjuvant uh, devices such as stents and flow diverters or intrasacular devices uh, at the time of the BRAT. Transcirculation techniques can be used for smaller vessel um, uh, aneurysms as well. This is a wide-necked uh, SCA aneurysm on the left. The left SCA uh, originates from the base of the aneurysm. You can imagine coiling this aneurysm if you did coil the aneurysm primarily, say with balloon assistance, in all likelihood you would occlude the proximal left superior cerebellar artery. So in this case, we opted for a transcirculation treatment coming across the um, posterior communicating artery on the right side, first placing a catheter in the aneurysm, catheterizing across the PCOM, across the PCA and basilar apex and into the left superior cerebellar artery, depositing a stent at the neck of the aneurysm and then coiling the uh, aneurysm. This is our construct catheter again in the right ICA and left vertebral artery, and then subsequent deposition of the stent and coil embolization. Again, a powerful technique. As interventionalists, we need to be able to do these techniques because of the different angulation of aneurysms. Sometimes it's better approached uh, retrograde via, than anterograde for treatment. This um, is uh, an example of stent-supported coil embolization, which remains, I think, a tried and true um, uh, treatment technique for, for wide-necked aneurysms. This was in the setting of subarachnoid and parenchymal hemorrhage, as you can see here. We use the Neuroform Atlas stent, and the Neuroform Atlas stent is a newer stent. Uh, it is designed specifically for deposition in small vessels ranging from two to 4.5 millimeters or so in diameter. So we're able now to place stents in smaller arteries. We're able to get there with our catheter uh, technology. The stent is characterized by having both a mixed open and closed cell design. The closed cells are at the ends of the stent and help secure the stent to the parent artery. The open portion of the stent is at the aneurysm neck where we're able then subsequently to traverse the tines uh, and go into the aneurysm for uh, coil embolization. What's very nice about these stents is that there's minimal foreshortening. So even if you're using a wider device in a narrow artery, it really still conforms to the length, uh, its prescribed length. However, it's not resheathable. So once you started deploying it, you really have uh, crossed the Rubicon, so to speak, and, and have to continue with, with uh, deposition uh, of the device. So this is uh, our working angle for treatment of this uh, wide-necked anterior communicating artery aneurysm. We've jailed our catheter through the stent. You can see the um, anterior cerebral artery here and then curving uh, to the right. That's where we wanna place our stent. This is the aneurysm site. Here's our catheter jailed. We've placed the atlas stent and then gone on to coil embolization. Here's the coil embolization initially. But what we, what we accomplished here was that we essentially walled off one of the teats of the aneurysm here. And I didn't feel comfortable leaving this particular 
uh, anatomic feature. I felt that now we would be pressurizing this particular teat here and exposing the patient to greater risk. So you're able to then remove the catheter and then re-navigate it again because of the relatively open cell design in the middle of the atlas stent. You can re-navigate through it even after pulling the catheter back out and navigate into that teat, coil that teat uh, to occlusion. Uh, as you can see in this particular picture, eight months later, that construct has remained stable. Intrasacular devices uh, have been an important contribution, a, a recent contribution. Uh, Adam Arthur and colleagues presented the Webit results, uh, the one-year Webit results at the uh, AANS last April. Um, the web device comes in two uh, anatomic uh, configurations, the more spherical and then more rectangular type of device. And what's important and essential for this device is that the device really has to be opposed to the, the walls, the lateral walls of the aneurysm in order to be effective and in order to prevent an endo leak into the aneurysm. Uh, this was the first device designed specifically for the treatment of wide neck bifurcation aneurysms. In the Webit trial, they um, enlisted 148 patients at 27 international sites. The U.S. was uh, by far the largest uh, sites of enrollers. Uh, they treated both ruptured and unruptured aneurysms and followed those for six months to a year. Uh, and the results were exceptional. The, uh, the safety profile was incredible. There was only one adverse event, 0.7%, and that was an intracranial hemorrhage at 22 days. There were no deaths in their series. 53.8% had complete occlusion, uh, and uh, 84 or close to 85% had adequate uh, occlusion though retreatment remains a, an issue and occurred in nearly 10%. When the web device works uh, and you've picked the correct type of aneurysm anatomically, it, uh, it is a joy to use. It can take just you know, several minutes to navigate the catheter to its desired location. Deposition of the device is relatively straightforward. This is an ideal case relatively wide neck aneurysm at the left MCA bifurcation. The device itself is conformal to the exact um, appearance of the aneurysm and the immediate results are, uh, are, are quite gratifying. This is a powerful uh, device, even in the setting of subarachnoid hemorrhage, but one that can be challenging uh, occasionally to use. And, and this is one of those scenarios. And, I think it becomes a bit more challenging to use uh, in the, in the uh, anterior communicating artery region. It's a relatively stiff guide catheter uh, and microcatheter that are required to uh, navigate and deploy the device. That microcatheter uh, will somewhat distort the angle of the anterior cerebral artery. You can see this bowing of the of the uh, microcatheter here, whereas before it was sloped. So that angles the microcatheter towards the sidewall of the aneurysm rather than towards the apex of the aneurysm. So we felt we were in a decent position, even though we were at roughly two o'clock in the aneurysm and deployed the device uh, and shot our controlled image before detaching the device and we created subarachnoid hemorrhage. We ruptured the inferior left lateral wall of the aneurysm. The key in that situation is to not deflate the device or retract the device, but to leave it in place, allow it to tamponade. Uh, but we had clearly obstructed the origin of the left A2 as uh, evidenced in this angiogram and we had slowed flow uh, and we're beginning to uh, thrombose the right A2 segment. So unfortunately, we had to go to the other side, uh, place a stent into the left uh, A1 into the right A2. We did that by partially recapturing the web device, uh, pulling it slightly into the catheter and advancing the catheter that had the a uh, concomitant effect of driving the web device through the dome of the aneurysm. 
Um, however, we kept the device in place, controlled angiography, didn't show any further hemorrhage. We deployed what uh, an Elvis Jr. stent across the neck of the aneurysm, spanning the right A2 to left A1, and then coiled the aneurysm. Small amount of coil herniation through the tines of the stent here. And really this is what I like to call a a complication crescendo, and these things can occur. I, I liken this to the, the fire at Notre Dame uh, last year, where uh, this devastating fire ruined parts of this uh, incredible uh, uh, church, uh, and the reconstruction was incredibly complicated. And that's what can happen when these devices uh, and their use uh, goes awry. This patient, however, did well. This is six months later, reasonable results. We're not gonna mess with this at this point. We've left him and he's done uh, well up to this point. Other uh, intrasacular devices include the contour device. This is a, um, a dual layered uh, radio opaque uh, device. Uh, it is really a flow diverter as well as a flow diverter. It's uh, nestled into the base of the aneurysm and, and deployed, and it diverts uh, and disrupts flow to the point where the aneurysm uh, occludes. And you can see here on this uh, model, the nice uh, flow diversion at the neck of the aneurysm towards the contralateral uh, artery. The pulse rider is another one of these neck bridging devices. The pedals of the device are deployed at the base of the aneurysm. The wider necked uh, shaft of the device adheres nicely to the parent artery en route to the bifurcation. Uh, and, it, it, and you detach this device and coil through it by navigating a catheter through it. This is our immediate result and this is the uh, long-term result. I, again, uh, a relatively straightforward device to use. It's not my preference any longer given um, the, the advent of the web device. These pedals are very fragile. What we've noticed is that uh, crossing them or recrossing them will often damage the device or manipulate the pedal uh, in one direction or the other. It's not a particularly durable uh, or substantial device. So it's one that I, I, I'm not a, a huge fan of, but it is somewhat effective. There are other neck bridging devices. The P-Conus device is an extension of the waffle cone technique. Uh, it essentially is a stent with a uh, flared uh, pedal-like system at its base that is driven to the base of an aneurysm and deployed. The pedals come in a variety of different sizes, ranging from five to 15 millimeters. The length of the shaft can vary from 20 to 25. And what we've seen in, in again, these single armed uh, evaluations is adequate occlusion in up to 80% of patients. The barrel, another uh, vascular reconstruction device, it's a true stent. That is, uh, that is bowed or expanded in its central region. And when deployed and pushed superiorly, bows even further into the neck of the aneurysm and can be easily crossed uh, to perform coil embolization. Moving now to uh, sidewall aneurysms, uh, a number of different techniques as well are employed. Balloon remodeling, stent assisted coiling, flow diversion, neck bridging devices, and I'll even add uh, intrasacular devices as well. We're starting now to use the web device in you know, wide neck PCOM aneurysms where we can get decent purchase into the aneurysm and deploy the device. Balloon remodeling, again, a tried and true technique that's not going away. We have uh, incredibly compliant balloons nowadays. The balloon actually, as you can see in this particular situation, herniating inferiorly into the aneurysm and protecting the ostium of this uh, posterior cerebral, uh, uh, posterior communicating artery and allowing uh, excellent coil embolization. The Atlas device, which I mentioned before, uh, which has a closed cell design on its end, 
has a more open cell design in its center. We use this in this wide necked left middle cerebral artery aneurysm, jailing a catheter and then coil embolizing the aneurysm. Again, a stent that's specifically designed for navigation and deployment in small vessels ranging from two to 4.5 millimeters in diameter. The uh, stent technology has evolved so that we now can now have developed very small stents that can serve as flow diverters. The Elvis Jr. stent is one of those, the low profile visualized intraluminal support device. It's very flexible, it's braided, uh, made of nitinol, and we can deliver this through smaller catheters. And that has really been a revolution for us to be able to navigate an SL10 or an echelon catheter and deploy a stent through that catheter, uh, which is highly navigable, uh, is really a, an incredible advance. In the past, we used to have to use uh, stiffer, uh, clunkier microcatheters to get our stents in place. The Elvis Jr. is resheathable up to 80% of its delivery. Uh, it enables shelf building, which basically is uh, pushing the stent forward so that it blossoms and, and pushes forward into the neck of the aneurysm. And it uh, provides greater flow diversion because of its increased metal density. Um, the metal coverage at, uh, along the stent is 17 to 23% in comparison to 6.5 to 9% for other open cell stents that we had been used, using in the past. The pivotal uh, United States Elvis uh, trial established the efficacy of the Elvis stent and the Elvis Jr. stent. Uh, the primary safety endpoints were stroke and death at 30 days and the primary efficacy endpoint was 100% occlusion at one year. Uh, and those were achieved largely in uh, almost 80% of patients, uh, the primary efficacy of 100% occlusion. 95% of patients had greater than 90% occlusion. Uh, and the safety margin, uh, safety profile of the device was excellent. 5.2% of patients had one safety uh, event. Felipe, a, do you think you can finish in two or three minutes? Yeah. Uh, the pipeline devices um, have been a revolution. The original device released and approved by the FDA in 2011. We now have three iterations of that device, including the Flex and the Pipeline Shield, not quite available for our usage. This device uh, really, as I mentioned, revolutionary, enabling us to treat an aneurysm like this, wide necked petrous aneurysm, partially thrombosed, Deposition of this device requires some gymnastics, balloon support to prevent herniation of the catheter, deposition of the device, uh, and coil embolization. Again, true coil supported, uh, stent supported coil embolization. Looking down the barrel of the uh, device, showing that the coils really remodel around it. There are a number of technical challenges. As I mentioned earlier, this is a cavernous aneurysm. Primary navigation was our initial attempt. We had to navigate over the dome of the aneurysm in order to get into a distal position to deploy the pipeline device. We used a balloon anchor technique as our grappling hook, navigating a balloon, distally inflating the balloon, again, enabling us to pull the catheter inferiorly and enabling us subsequently to deploy uh, multiple devices across the neck of the aneurysm here and here, and this device works uh, incredibly. At post-operative day number three, with deposition of two devices, nearly complete resolution of the aneurysm. The Fred and Fred Jr. flow diverters, uh, again, another type of flow diverter, a bit different in terms of its construct from the pipeline device. Uh, flow diversion has some unique properties. It creates neoendothelial channels through aneurysms, uh, I won't belabor you with this, but this is an, a, an interesting case in which a neoendothelial channel reconstitutes the anterior cerebral artery. Um, as you can see in this picture here, where the PCOM fills the aneurysm, a channel fills the anterior cerebral artery and fills then distally into the uh, distal ACA. 
surpass and surpass evolve recently were approved uh, after the scent trial another type of flow diverter flow diversion works this is a, a basler fenestration aneurysm long construct across the fenestration we have different technology now that can enable us to plan our deposition of these devices we can plug in the size of the device and it can tell us exactly what it's going to look like flow diversion works here's the pre-pipeline uh, pictures post pipeline reorienting the flow diver the uh, flow uh, into the uh, into the aneurysm a year later and finally the neck bridging devices uh, are another advent that have uh, improved our ability to treat these complex uh, lesions the komenichi device uh, is a uh, temporarily uh, deployed device uh, where we can inflate the, uh, the stent at the neck of the aneurysm, coil through it, and then remove the stent. Then uh, this really obviates our need for uh, use of dual antiplatelet uh, therapy. Where are we gonna go in the future? My friend, Alan Mitha uh, uh, in Canada is, uh, I think uh, is leading the charge here in the development of uh, bioabsorbable stents. And I think that this holds tremendous uh, promise for treatment of these complex lesions in the future. So to conclude, this is a heterogeneous group of uh, aneurysms. Um, historically, microsurgical and endovascular treatments have only proven marginally effective. We're challenged by recanalization, by regrowth and, and hemorrhage of uh, these lesions and endovascular treatments have certainly undergone a revolution which really has been led by flow diversion and now by intrasacular and neck bridging devices. Uh, but common endovascular techniques are still indicated including balloon and stent assistance. Um, but we really need now to turn the page and learn to address patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, and I think we're be beginning to meet that imperative but I, I'll end by, by uh, prefacing Sanders talk that, that I am a firm believer in microsurgical techniques. And I think that these remain uh, important uh, in uh, the treatment of these complicated lesions. Thank you for your time. Hope I didn't run too far over. Thank you, Felipe, for this uh, very useful uh, summary of everything available endovascularly for this. Uh, and as I said at the beginning, we'll we'll do discussion later. So without further ado, Sander, won't you share? Oh, stop sharing your slides, Felipe, if you don't mind, and then Sander can load yeah. his. Okay. Share my Can you see it okay? Uh, yes. Great. So that was a wonderful talk by uh, Philippe. And um, as uh, he noted at the end, he's a firm believer in microsurgery and I'm a firm believer in endovascular solutions to wide neck aneurysm. So it's not gonna be a, that competitive a discussion. I do wanna start by thanking Jacques. I mean, this is an amazing thing you're running here and, and uh, we're all watching it on a weekly basis. and. Uh, Kudos to everyone in, in Miami for, for making this possible. I think one of the first things that I thought about when I talked about this is, you know, everyone knows how to clip aneurysm, so it's not going to be as fun as listening to Philippe's 12 new devices. Um, we're using pretty much the same devices that I trained with, but I think the judgment for, for when we use the devices, how we use them, I think has evolved. And I think one of the things that Philippe touched on is the issue of what is a wide neck aneurysm and how do we decide from, from a um, evidence-based standpoint, uh, which should be treated with surgery and which might be better treated with the endovascular approach. And part of that difficulty in uh, understanding the literature is what is actually a wide neck aneurysm. And so uh, this is a paper that just from last year by Park and colleagues um, and what they, what they said is that, you know, it's obvious that these are both uh, on the upper level on the right and on the lower level, these are both wide-necked aneurysms. 
But these are very different in terms of uh, the challenges that they present in endovascular surgeon. And so you might have an aneurysm that's a little bit bigger, might have some perforator stuck to it, might be in a difficult spot, but even though it's wide neck, the anatomy is quite good for coiling and for an intrasacular device like uh, Philippe showed you with the, um, with the um, web device. Uh, this, this setup though is um, not great and requires lots of um, gymnastics as, uh, as Philippe showed you, often uh, putting in T-stents and things like that, where a simple clipping would be really easy because it's a small aneurysm, it's gonna be very amenable to a surgical approach, especially in the setting of a subarachnoid hemorrhage where you have to put a stent and deal with uh, dual antiplatelet agents or a very young patient where you're gonna have to have a stent in for a long time. It's gonna be a, a more of a challenge in terms of medications, et cetera. Uh, people have looked at what the literature looks like in terms of defining what a wide neck aneurysm is. And uh, this is a recent paper in Journal of Neurosurgery and you can see that the definitions vary dramatically. And this has made it very difficult to interpret um, the series, the single alarm series that people are presenting in terms of durability, risk, et cetera, et cetera. Obviously these are all wide necked aneurysms, but they're, they're very different in terms of the challenges they present for an endovascular solution and therefore the opportunities afforded by a microsurgical solution. Um, one of the papers that I uh, pulled in, in trying to uh, update my understanding of this uh, topic was uh, from, um, uh, you know, it's coming out on December 1st. And this is a very interesting paper because to me, this really is trying to put a round peg in a square, uh, you know, a square peg in a round hole. This is a this series where they conclude that uh, endovascular approaches to wide neck aneurysms are, are really quite good. Um, they stent coiled all these aneurysms. Look at the size of these aneurysms. Mean size 1.68 millimeters and seven of these were asymptomatic. You have to ask yourself, what, what are they doing um, in terms of treating asymptomatic two millimeter or sub two millimeter aneurysms? Um, and, and with that, they were only getting a 90% you know, occlusion rate and a 5% early recurrence rate. With, with surgery for these aneurysms in the setting of subarachnoid hemorrhage, you would never have that kind of occlusion rate or re early recurrence rate. And here's a case just from last week that I was asked to deal with. And this is a, you know, a, a very unusual bilobed aneurysm ruptured, could be treated with uh, some sort of uh, stent gymnastics, but, but really, I mean, it's just much more straightforward for a microsurgical approach and uh, really presents very little nuance for the um, experienced surgeon. So I think that in some of these aneurysms, microsurgery really just makes a lot more sense right now. There may be new devices that come along, but for today, I think this is a great case for microsurgery. If you look at the web data, and I'm, I'm fascinated by this because the FDA has asked me to speak about this device on several occasions, and you look at some of the recent reports, one of the things that really sticks out to me, and I've heard the same thing from people putting these in, that it's really uh, quite, quite nice when it goes well, because it really takes very, very little time and very little effort. But as Philippe showed you, there can be uh, problems with perforation. But the thing that really strikes me in this data is the low complete occlusion rates. Uh, you're usually using a web in, in the setting of somebody with an unruptured aneurysm. And I just wonder what, you know, a 53% complete occlusion rate really means for the natural history of an unruptured aneurysm. As you know, unruptured aneurysms have a pretty benign natural history um, to begin with. And, and to improve upon that with an incomplete occlusion, to me, seems um, probably... Um, probably less than ideal. If you look at the, um, the way that they discuss complete occlusion also, it's with, with this, even with this little bump that doesn't really control the neck region in terms of uh, the repair that it's considered a complete occlusion. So I just think that when you look at this literature and you think about this, I think there are patients where 
a microsurgical approach really you want to avoid and the web is great basal or apex pointing back in the brainstem high no question about it but I mean, for an MCA aneurysm in a young patient with uh, an easy sylvian fissure to split, I think that um, surgery is going to outperform this device for durability for, for certain. Um, if you look at uh, some medium size uh, series, uh, Philippe talked about the ATLAS trial. And again, I thought that this data was better than the web data in terms of the uh, Raymond Roy um, um, uh, repair rates. But you're still really kind of in the 80 to 85 percent range with a 5 percent risk of uh, stroke or death. And so I think if, uh, if in your hands um, you think the aneurysm is going to have less than a, you know, 4 or 5 percent risk of stroke or death with surgery and you're, you can improve upon that uh, 85 percent um, perfect uh, anatomy, then you definitely should consider microsurgery for those patients. Uh, this is another Atlas um, uh, um, series. Um, this one from Korea, uh, same size more or less. Interesting procedural complications were much higher than the ones uh, reported in the, um, in the other series and uh, complete obliteration rates uh, slightly lower. The other thing is there's there's frank residual aneurysm in about nine percent of cases, and um, that's something that you you just don't see with uh, modern surgery. If you look at the uh, other uh, stents, um, this is a recent data published in Stroke on the uh, from the Sent trial. And if you look at this, same kinds of things: complete occlusion rates, you know, far less than you would see with surgery, and 12-month stroke and death rates. Uh, certainly in excess of what most surgeons would, uh, would, would be taking people to the operating room for. So I think that if you're, if you're looking at taking care of uh, low risk surgical cases, um, then, then these uh, devices, at least today, don't really uh, compare that favorably. Um, if you look at a meta-analysis of, you know, 2,500 aneurysms, and this is problematic because obviously these are obtained with multiple devices over a long period of time. You still look at the same kind of stuff, recanalization and retreatment rates that are far in excess of surgery and long-term neurological outcomes that really map identically to surgery, so uh, to microsurgery. So I, I don't think a lot to, um, to hang your hat on. Obviously there are cases that you would not want to operate on um, but, and then uh, Philippe talked about the BRAT trial and obviously he knows more about it than, than anybody. But I do think that what, what this trial does show is that microsurgery really does have a role in wide neck aneurysms and that um, it, it really can perform um, similarly in terms of clinical outcomes. And that uh, if you're dealing with young patients where retreatment is really uh, something you'd want to avoid, somebody who's going to get lost to follow up, um, for instance, then I think that um, uh, microsurgery really has some distinct advantages. That said, I think you know we have to keep an open mind. There are many ways to skin a cat, and usually the best way to do that is what's best in your team and your uh, individual's hands. So. What works best at the Barrow is different than what works best in Miami or Columbia. And so I think you really have to uh, size this uh, discussion to what your uh, skill set is. Regardless of where you're trying to treat these um, lesions, I really do think a team approach is necessary. And um, the reason it is, is you don't want to be pushing your technique beyond where it needs to be. And, um, and, and so while, um, you know, many people will, uh, you know, be treating both open and uh, microsurgically themselves. There may be cases where you're really pushing things uh, beyond where the technology really needs, to, really uh, is for the patient at that time. And maybe uh, uh, looking to somebody else to help you is, is not an unreasonable thing. So when would I consider an endovascular repair for a wide neck aneurysm? I think it's as simple as this. When the risk of the microsurgery is higher than that of an endovascular repair, 
um, especially if the microsurgical repair is, is likely to be less than ideal. And th there are situations like this. I, I always opt for the endovascular uh, approach. Um, the other situation where I really like an endovascular repair for a wide neck aneurysm is when a patient has favorable anatomy for it, especially the proximal ICA. I think the uh, pipeline devices and the, and the flow diversion there is a, it, it, an amazing game changer, much better than what we were doing with suction decompression or cardiac arrest or any of that. This is a, a much better uh, solution, but also especially when patients need to be on anticoagulation or high dose antiplatelet therapy. I think it, there's no reason to be doing microsurgery in this day and age on those patients when they're such good endovascular options. When, when do I really kind of favor a microsurgical repair? I think when the endovascular risk is higher than the microsurgical risk. And, that's, and that usually is anytime you're dealing with a very small and favorable um, microsurgical aneurysm. So a small aneurysm at the MCA bifurcation, a small aneurysm at the ophthalmic. These are often ruptured aneurysms, uh, small PCOM aneurysm. These, these are things that I think really, really uh, are, are better treated with uh, open surgery. The other place that I find that uh, people tend to be a little intimidated, but once you've done a few, it's really uh, quite a nice microsurgical case, is the pericolosal artery aneurysm. That, that aneurysm is almost always an, uh, a, um, a wide neck, um, even though it's small. It has a small neck, but compared to the parent vessel, it's very wide neck. And it's really treated very easily with uh, open surgery once you've done a few. And um, the, the endovascular solution is, is usually more co complicated and less durable. Um, I think uh, any time that you're really worried about durability, there's, there's really you know, very little evidence in, in the literature to suggest that any of these endovascular approaches really does what microsurgery does, which is reform the wall with the full, uh, the full uh, thickness of the wall with the clip. That, of course, requires you to clip the aneurysm correctly, which is usually along the long axis of, of the opening. Uh, but that can be done quite easily as long as you expose the entire aneurysm before placing the clip. Um, another time, and I referred to this earlier, is when you have a patient that's unlikely to be compliant with aspirin or, or the lifestyle changes that might uh, be required by an endovascular approach in terms of follow-up. Um, I think when you have difficult arch anatomy, time to back out and consider another uh, option. And then I think when you have multiple aneurysms that are all wide necked and small, I think it really probably is better treated with a microsurgical clipping. I think, however, there is an elephant in the room on this discussion. And uh, I think that over time, what we've seen here is that, uh, at least in New York State, that um, patients are increasingly opting for this and surgeons are increasingly um, uh, choosing to do an endovascular repair over a microsurgical repair. And I think there are a lot of different reasons for that. I think uh, there are more people treating these aneurysms, so it's hard to get uh, as much experience. And I think that if, if that's the case, then definitely go with what, what works for you. I also think that um, patients are really not that concerned with retreatment um, and the extra follow-up. What they really don't want is to have their head opened. And so I, I think that, that, you know, if you're really listening to the patient, I think that really does drive this decision in a lot of uh, 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 cases. So this is the kind of uh, case that I think could be treated uh, with a, with a uh, intrasacular device. In fact, I saw a different surgeon recently and, um, and they recommended a web for this MCA aneurysm. Person's pretty young, super healthy, 40. This is completely asymptomatic. And um, I thought that this was not great for a web device. I thought that the, uh, the, the branches of, of, the, of this division, this inferior division, really were involved in the neck, not just one branch, but both. And I also thought that um, this aneurysm on the other side, this MCA aneurysm, 
was really the, the also the, the vessel really comes out of the neck. And so I, I kind of, you know, ripped it on Judy and, and said, well, you know, why not take care of both of them at the same sitting and just clip both of them. So I, I think that that's um, certainly a reasonable uh, option. Um, if you're going to treat uh, wide neck aneurysms, though, I think you do have to be prepared uh, for complications. And uh, if, you, if you're prepared up front, then uh, just like with the endovascular um, bailout techniques that Philippe um, referred to, I think that really can help you uh, once the fire starts uh, burning. I think to have the STA ready if, if for a potential bypass is very helpful. It's easy to get on, the, on most anterior circulation aneurysms. I have a complete trapping plan. And in fact, um, being able to trap the aneurysm with um, uh, temporary clips, I think is a good thing, even if you never use any of the temporary clips. I like the, uh, the Dan Barrow techniques with the, uh, both the sling and the crimping of either muscle or, um, or uh, muslin against the uh, a, a neck tear. And I had to do that recently and it works out great, but if you're not prepared for it, um, it can be uh, very daunting to come up with that solution under the stress of the moment. I think um, uh, most uh, can be, most aneurysms can be clipped directly in line with the vessel, but occasionally you have to do things like picket fence techniques. You have to use uh, fenestrated clips and curved clips to kind of gather dog ears. And um, I think that you have to be aware that your initial plan for the clipping may not lay out the way you wanted it to. A, a perfect example is the case I did today, which was a, um, you know, a inferior wall uh, blowout of an ICA and somebody who couldn't take aspirin. And um, I thought I was going to clip this with a fenestrated clip and the fenestration just kept kinking the vessel and compressing the optic nerve in a way I didn't want and had to use a kind of one of those alligator side biting clips. So always have a couple of secondary plans. Um, in ruptured aneurysms, I think uh, decompression is always something that's on the table, especially um, uh, in patients that may uh, have ischemia. And so I'm always prepared to um, float a flap or leave a flap out. And, and I think that that can uh, really help you in terms of uh, getting through some of these problems. I have a case that um, I'm gonna share a little bit differently. Let's see if I can do this. Uh, this is a case um, that um, I actually wanted to manage uh, with an endovascular device, and it really presented some problems for it. Uh, so this is, a, let's see if this is playing. So this is the, this case, this is a 40-year-old a person, uh, you know, with a history of uh, Graves' disease, and uh, she has an aneurysm that's kind of a blowout of the ophthalmic segment. The ophthalmic artery comes out of it, there's a carotid cave aneurysm that um, we thought was going to be actually extra, extra dural, and it was. And then she has this very large, um, it's actually giant, the filling portion's not giant, um, ICA bifurcation aneurysm. And I was hoping that um, this could be uh, stented um, into the M1 and potentially come across the ACOM um, with, Sorry to know. interrupt, doctor. Uh, yeah. We can see some information in the bottom right at the bottom. If you can open up everything, please. Is that better? Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, the the a the coming across uh, a one to to finish this off, um, but due to some arch anatomy and some difficulties with um, with uh, placing the stent, uh, that was abandoned, and we were asked for a microsurgical repair. And um, I think that, that this case, um, you know, brought up a couple of technical things that I think are kind of interesting. One is that I think it's really necessary in a case like this to fully expose the aneurysm. So this is us taking, once we've split the fissure and you, you can see the uh, MCA branches here, we're just actually resecting the brain that's over this. And there are all these veins that are attached to this. These are not arteries. But if you go to try to clip this and, and get this um, you know, fully decompressed, those veins are gonna bleed a lot. So 
Um, in the interest of time, I'm, there's the, uh, the proximal aneurysm. So I'm trapping it. I'm getting a clip on the ICA. I'm exposing the A1, that's Huebner, uh, next to the A1 for another temporary clip. And then we're going to trap this aneurysm. There's the A1 by clipping the MCA up here. And so, and so now the aneurysm is completely trapped and I'm gonna to try to reconstruct the neck with a fenestrated clip above the A1. That's the A1 down there. And um, every time I did this um, and I put on several clips and then kept taking clips off, the, what you know, obviously always happens, the, the pressure of the aneurysm just pushes the clips down and occludes uh, the M1. And so what we had to do was, so this is a second fenestrated clip coming down and then taking off the first fenestrated clip. And that actually looked good, but the flow on the intraoperative angiogram was not what I wanted. And so what we ended up having to do is, I'll just, for the interest of time, um, we had to cut the aneurysm open under, under a, a rest, you know, under um, uh, trapping techniques, and then just suck out enough of this clot and thrombosis and get enough of the blood out of the dome, didn't have to take it all out, to get the, uh, the, the aneurysm soft enough so that we could get it clipped. And we had an STA available to us and, and that would have been possible, but we, um, we didn't need that and everything worked out quite nicely. Um, this is what it looks like at the end. Uh, we left this, this was extra dural, but this is a pretty nice repair actually in terms of, um, of what she can get. And this is a 30 year old woman. And uh, while this could have been done with a, a stent, obviously there were some issues related to putting in the stent and so I thought this was a reasonable alternative. So with that, I'm going to, let's see if I can close this, go back to my slides, sorry about that. Uh, and, um, and just uh, finish up with this case, which is somebody that I saw this week, who's 68 years old, has a congestive heart failure with an EF of, of about six, I don't know, 20%, 15 or 20%, not very good. And she has this large uh, basilar blowout. And this doesn't look that different from what Philippe showed you earlier. The difference is look at all this calcium in these vessels. And so while I think it wouldn't be unreasonable to refer this for an endovascular approach, I think it's probably equally reasonable if you think about it to follow a patient like this on aspirin and see how they do. If this doesn't grow and it's stable, I'm not sure that the risk of, of trying to stent this is, is totally worth it with all that calcium in both vertebrals and in the basilar. So with that, I think I'll uh, stop and uh, stop sharing and take any questions or do whatever Jacques thinks is best. Thanks, Andrew. Very nice, very nice two complimentary talks. Uh, now we're no, uh, so uh, let me actually, if I can run two questions from the audience before I ask Judy to, to show her case, um, it, both of you could, could answer. So this is from Vernard Fennell. What do you think is the role of duly trained cerebrovascular neurosurgeon? Is there pressure to focus on one modality over the other? Felipe, maybe you want to handle this one first? Sure. Um Thanks for the question, Vern. Hope you're doing well. Um, I, I do think there is pressure on, on um, the surgeon to, to preferentially uh, do one versus the other uh, to at a higher volume. What my advice to, to our fellows really is, is if you really want to pursue this and, and want to become a dual accomplished surgeon, then you have to go somewhere where there is uh, an adequate volume of both. And you have to go somewhere where you're not the only one doing one or the other of these procedures. Uh, you can't work in a vacuum. 
Um, I think it's possible. I think it's uh, the you know, relatively rare surgeon that, that does these at, at the highest level. I think the majority of dual, dual trained surgeons probably do one uh, better than the other or much better than the other, uh, but it is possible to do. But again, I think it's really volume related. Uh, I think you have to be at a center that, that sees pathology to the extent where you're gonna be, become adept uh, at, at doing both types of uh, technical procedures. And that's a, that's a difficult thing to, to do. Sander, do you, do you disagree or? Uh, oh, other... I, I completely concur. I think that what Philippe uh, said is exactly right. The two things that are critical is to not work in a vacuum. So to have senior partners um, or other seasoned people who, who understand both sides of the equation and then enough volume. So it's hard to imagine um, in this day and age that there are gonna be many places where as, a, as somebody doing a hybrid practice, you're gonna be able to have you know, lots and lots of complicated uh, endovascular cases and lots and lots of open microsurgical cases and busy accomplished um, colleagues who are also doing it on both sides. I mean, it's just it, the, the volume numbers become difficult. And so that's why I think that the reality is, is that most people practicing are probably practicing in some lower volume setting uh, with less than that ideal support. And so uh, they have to really follow what they think is the best solution in their hands. And so some of them may be uh, very, very adept microsurgeons and, and less sophisticated endovascular surgeons or vice versa. And um, so I think that um, my, my expectation is as the technology continues to improve, um, there will be more and more opportunity to treat these cases with uh, endovascular solutions for the hybrid surgeon. Um, but probably as long as the hybrid surgeon has had some reasonable training, straightforward microsurgical cases should be um, pretty straightforward for them to take care of. Okay, and I'm gonna. Uh, he, Vern also has a second question, which probably is, I think, easier to answer and less kind of. Do you? Th is, what he's really asking is: of, is the availability of endovascular th uh, treatment uh, creating an over treatment of small aneurysms that you would have otherwise followed up? Uh, uh, are we abusing endovascular? Uh, I think I know the answer myself, but I'll let you guys answer this. Uh, Felipe, is there an abuse of uh, endovascular on with small aneurysms, two, three millimeter, simply because we can? Yeah. I mean, I certainly, Jacques. I think I, I think that's the case. We we we've seen that. Uh, since the advent of flow diversion with the pipeline embolization device, where there are there are lots of folks and, and and lots of centers that are treating very small aneurysms with flow diversion when they when the natural history really really doesn't support that, um, and that those are the kinds of things that really hurt our field because inevitably what will happen is that the complications will increase and they'll increase dramatically. Sandra mentioned uh, these smaller aneurysms are, are technically you know, challenging to, to treat. Um, some devices are easier to, to use in that setting than others, but still uh, the vast majority probably don't need to be treated. Uh, and to apply these um, you know, relatively fancy and complex endovascular techniques, I think potentially harms the field because inevitably you're taking what is a, a relatively benign pathology and subjecting it to a somewhat higher risk uh, treatment. And that's, that's not gonna work out well in the end. Although what's interesting, Sander, in your paper that you, you, you quoted in your own talk, I've actually used the results of your paper in some of my talks is when you compare the 10 centers in the New York area, there are many interesting things about that paper, uh, but one of them is that you, what you're essentially, what you found, which is not unexpected, is that uh, it is easier to get away with suboptimal endovascular treatment 
than it is to get away with suboptimal microsurgical treatment. Am I, do you agree with, I mean, that's one of yeah, the- really... I, I, Yeah, and I think that we see that with a lot of things, uh, both in uh, vascular as well as outside. So another area is radio surgery, right? Yeah. Uh, can under treat an AVM with radio surgery and the complication rate will be zero and uh, you right. run a treatment and uh, there you have it. And so um, I think that we have to be very uh, cognizant as a community that this, uh, this is out there. It exists in things other than vascular, things other than neurosurgery. Right. Um, but that it's really on us and to kind of hold up the, our, our profession as as being patient centered, and uh, I think <coughs> under treating a um, an unruptured aneurysm, unless the patient's really young, it's probably not doing anything to the natural history. I mean, I mean, it just it just it just does, is not doing anything. So you're, it's all risk and and probably very little benefit. Um, and, and yet, you know, if there's not a complication, everyone's happy, the hospital's happy, the patient feels psychologically like something's been done. Um, and so, and, and because this is not, you know, big ticket stuff for the healthcare system, uh, no one's really screaming and yelling about it, um, the way they are with spinal instrumentation or what have you. So I do think that, um, it's on us to, uh, to walk the walk, show show our trainees and colleagues that we, we we're not going to do this, and just and just hope that uh, eventually um, people kind of morph away from that sort of behavior. All right, Judy, I invite you to to show us your case and and, and tell us your thoughts, and oh. of course ask the speakers how they might handle right. whatever right. case you're going to show them, and then right. tell us what you've done. Well, I also want to applaud you, Jock, and your whole team for doing this. This is amazing. Um, you know, I've actually just enjoyed this last hour so much because uh, hearing from Felipe and Sander, you know, who really are giants in their respective fields, to actually give this, you know, sort of very thoughtful presentation, really with an overview of where the field stands now is incredible. And I hope that everybody in the audience really appreciates that. Having them both uh, share their views is actually quite amazing. Um, I have to, my only disclosure is that I was one of those people that passed through Sanders lab. Uh, and, uh, you know, he was uh, quite uh, an inspiration, uh, has always been, you know, from the beginning and, and still is. So um, just wanted to, you know, get that out there as I give my presentation. The other thing I was thinking of as Felipe was talking is, you know, there's always going to be the evolution of these devices. So, right, we have the Elvis and then the Elvis Jr. coming along and then the Fred, and then the next iteration is the Fred Jr. And so I think we have to pay a lot of attention to getting the micro neurosurgeon junior. And that's what is actually lacking. And we, if we don't pay attention, we're gonna, going to lose that skill, lose that art. And I think that that is something that we have to pay attention to and, and sort of uh, counter, you know, sort of the, the forces out there that we were alluding to earlier. So, uh, I'll just get that out there and then we'll talk about my case and then everybody else talk and I hope we have more uh, conversation about this. So I'm going to share my screen and um, see what uh, the panelists would do with this. So we have, do you see the screen yet or no? Uh, yes, but go on the presentation mode. Oh, pres presentation. Like a slideshow. Yep, yeah, you got it. Okay. Do I need to do display no, settings? Yeah, no, but we're seeing two slides at the same time. We're seeing the next one as well. Oh. You know, if you... How about that? Yes, perfect. Okay, great. So 36-year-old woman incidentally discovered approximately 8 millimeter by 7 millimeter left ophthalmic aneurysm. Totally found incidentally. She has a factor 5 Leiden mutation and recurrent and chronic DBTs because of that may Thurner syndrome. And she's on Lovenox and needs to be on it. She also has lupus. So because of her may Turner syndrome and all the chronic DBTs, she's had actually an iliac vein stent as well as an IVC filter. She actually has a positive family history, aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage and a grandmother, uh, but she does not smoke. And of course she's totally normal. She complained of some visual obscurations, but I 
uh, could not detect any visual field deficits or problems and actually got her a full uh, formal visual uh, evaluation and she had no deficits. So this is her aneurysm, paraphthalmic, and uh, I'll just note that the, here's the ophthalmic artery coming from the base of the aneurysm. And if uh, we can start with uh, Philippe, Felipe. Yeah. Um, what was the uh, what was the, um, the the dimensions of the aneurysm again? About uh, uh, seven by uh, seven point six or something. Okay. Well, I, there there are the two aneurysms there. Yes. Uh, one just proximal to that larger uh, ophthalmic segment. Yeah. Yep. Right there. Um, yep. That one may not. That one's just I, I think a little above the ring. So I think. That one also is is within the subarachnoid space. Um, I would, in this situation, I would use a flow diverter. I know that the uh, artery originates from the base of the aneurysm. Uh, I don't really think that that is particularly problematic. What we've seen uh, is that with time, even with coverage uh, across the neck of the aneurysm, what will happen is the aneurysm will regress and a channel will form through the aneurysm to reconstitute the ophthalmic artery. I think it would be very unusual to see uh, acute occlusion of the ophthalmic artery with initial flow uh, diversion. If that ophthalmic artery occludes, I think it would probably occlude in a very delayed fashion uh, over time, and the patient probably would be able to tolerate that. In fact, I'd, I'd, I'd be shocked if the patient didn't tolerate that. I wouldn't put coils in the aneurysm uh, specifically because I think you would obtain a, um, an acute occlusion of the, the ophthalmic artery and that potentially could blind the patient. But I think this is a good one for flow diversion and it would cover the proximal aneurysm as well. Uh, F Felipe, I don't know if you caught her past history. Are you not hesitant because of her syndrome and her hypercoagulable uh, state. Uh, she's had, uh, what did she have? DVTs? Yes. And, yes. Yeah. Chronic DVTs. So she's yeah. already stented for that, has an IVC filter and is on Lovenox. Needs sure. chronic anti anticoagulation. Yeah. I, uh, those are, are, are certainly considerations. Um, and she is young. Um, so yeah, if, if she's unable to uh, tolerate those medications or continues to have the these kinds of problems, then, then you could consider certainly a surgical clip ligation. But uh, outside of that, uh, if I wasn't taking into account the, the past medical history, I think this is a great one for flow diversion. Felipe, I'm sorry to interrupt you, uh, Judy. Felipe, while you're on this, maybe you could summarize for the audience, are there any ophthalmic aneurysms, I'm just pure ophthalmic that you would favor microsurgical clipping in 2020 on? Or is that you believe, and I know Giuseppe Lenzino as well, uh, believe that it's purely endovascular when doable? Is that a fair statement of your position? Yeah, I, I, I think so. I think it's the, it's the very rare ophthalmic aneurysm that, that we pass on. I think we've seen our results, uh, even with aneurysms that uh, that harbor the, the the parent vessel or the ophthalmic artery coming off its side, or you know even closer to the dome, that those those aneurysms still regress and and the ophthalmic artery continues to fill. So, I think uh, yeah, I would be I'd be hard pressed to pass on an ophthalmic uh, aneurysm for flow diversion. Judy, back to you. Question. Great right. question. All right. So, Sander, you're up. So I was going to look at it the almost the diametrically opposed, which is that normally I would say um, in a young patient with an ophthalmic, if I could spare them having a you know a pipeline in there for a long time, I I would would you know offer them that. They might choose the pipeline, and I would be fine with that for this uh, case. I think the history here is really the the issue. I mean, I think there's equipoise; they could be treated either way. Right. Um, the the issue is that I don't like taking her off anticoagulation to operate on her, right. and so I'd like to keep her on the Lovenox, 
And if she's had that iliac stent in or iliac vein stent in for a while and has not had any thrombotic events related to that, I would suspect that she would tolerate the, the pipeline in an arterial setting uh, quite nicely. I, I suspect that proximal aneurysm uh, is, is not intradural. I think it's probably extradural, but um, it, it does um, let you know what, you know, how diseased the vessel is. And, and that's one of the nice things about a pipeline reconstruction is that you're, you're kind of reforming the, uh, the artery. I also have not seen uh, in our pipeline series any problems related to the ophthalmic artery. Um, and we would not put coils in this either. Um, that said, um, we have seen some problems with people with delayed uh, issues related to uh, thromboembolic events. And, uh, but like I say, I think if she's tolerated the stent in her uh, venous system for a while, then she's probably likely to tolerate it uh, in her arterial system. But, but I don't have a, a lot, a lot of experience with this specific um, uh, setup. I mean, we do see lots of people with factor V Leiden and we do see a lot of hypercoagulable patients. Um, and we do tend to um, shy away from putting things in their vessels when we see them. But the fact that she's already had a stent put in and maybe is tolerating it might might give you some clue that in this patient she might be able to tolerate it. Yeah. So I agree with both of you, and I ended up feeling like this. She was like a hot potato that uh, everybody wanted to throw to the other person. Um, you know, the everybody touched upon these management considerations. So there's this issue of her needing anticoagulation and antiplatelets, you know, so is that a good thing for endovascular or a good thing for microsurgery? Hard to say. Um, there was a concern here with my partners uh, worrying that um, having the ophthalmic artery at the base of the aneurysm would leave the aneurysm incompletely occluded um, because of the, the need for that uh, vessel to stay open. And so ultimately, um, really, I had to discuss with her many times. And you know, you were mentioning, Sander, that in a lot of people, they don't want their head cut open. Uh, I tried to talk her out of surgery multiple times. And believe it or not, because she had that family history and she sort of knew that what the issues were, she wanted as something as definitive as possible. She was not worried about having a craniotomy and really came back to me several times. I sent her away to talk to everybody else, you know, and, and was hoping that uh, she would be taken care of, but she kept on coming back. And so I did take her to surgery uh, for um, a uh, clipping with a uh, anterior clinoidectomy and uh, also did a, a left neck dissection. And so I'll try to do the video now. And this video is uh, made by my fellow, Risheng Shu, and um, he's doing a, a year with us as an open microsurgery fellow. Um, he's an infolded fellow. So you can see the falsiform ligament being elevated. This is him operating, and he's uh, dividing the falsiform ligament. We're creating a, a U-shaped flap in the dura. This is an intradural uh, clinoidectomy, which is our practice as opposed to extradural for these. You can see the aneurysm dome at the bottom of the screen here, uh, right there, that's already partially exposed. And so the I, I do think that there are improvements in our microsurgical tools. So this is the Sonopet, this is the ultrasonic aspirator and you know, taking away the clinoid with that as opposed to using a diamond burr is a, a, a different uh, feel, especially when it comes to my blood pressure, because uh, it's, you're really not pointing at the dome of the aneurysm as, a, as one used to have to do with those drills. And uh, so here we are uh, coring out the anterior clinoid, um, separating out from the optic strut and so forth. And here's the neck of the aneurysm. You can see the secondary dilatation, very angry uh, uh, dome there. And that little aneurysm, by the way, was extradural. And so the first clip going on after the ophthalmic is exposed, and um, it, it was because of the wide wall, it was clear that one clip was not enough to occlude the aneurysm. So I put a second clip on, and then we actually did do ICG, and it showed that the aneurysm dome was still filling. 
So I went back and actually you see that a little bit there and then I had to stack a third clip. Um, so again, that instance of sort of, you have to adapt what you do based on what the reality shows you. Um, and so I did not expect to have to use so many clips. I didn't think it was that big of an aneurysm, but it ended up that I needed the closing strength of all those clips uh, to really keep the best, keep the aneurysm closed and the ophthalmic uh, open. So this is uh, closing the dural flap and uh, reconstructing the dural opening with some tacoseal to seal the dura. And uh, she did have headaches afterwards because, you know, people with a clinoidectomy do tend to get headaches post-op. Here's the ophthalmic that's open. And um, that was her. So, uh, you know, I suspected that she would be difficult and I was not wrong um, because, you know, she actually had great vision for two days. And then on post-op day two, she started losing her vision. And uh, I suspect actually that because of her prothrombotic state, you know, and where I could not restart her Lovenox, I did not feel comfortable restarting anticoagulation uh, immediately. I think that she probably closed down her ophthalmic artery because we did, we did uh, get visual problems. So be happy to hear everybody's thoughts on that. Judy, sorry, you have proof that the ophthalmic closed off, you repeated? I, no, did not, did not yet. No, that's presumption. Oh, I see. Uh, it was, it happened in a delayed fashion. So usually if there's a thermal injury, you know, from drill or the, uh, uh, you know, the ultrasonic aspirator, you would expect that to manifest, I think, a little earlier. So it happened like, I think, more than 48 hours afterwards. Mm. I mean, the angel you, sh you showed post-op, um, you know, I'm sure you've seen the images more detail. The mm -hmm. ophthalmic fillings, maybe it's a timing that you chose to show mm -hmm. much, much less than pre-op, no? Or was yeah, it? Yeah, I felt like it was probably a little less robust. Yeah, um, yeah it's possible. But yeah, it was the, it was the, you know, I actually did have to adjust the clips to back off on the first clip. The most proximal clip, I had to back off a little bit because I thought it was occluding the ophthalmic. The other thing, the other technical thing I usually worry about what, when I clip these is the distal dual ring tends to tether thing. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, you know, it's an edited video. I don't yeah. know if the, if the distal dual ring acted as like a guillotine or you know I mean, as mm -hmm. you close it off, it, it can do that. So I'm, right. you know. That's a but, good point. That's a good point. I did make a note of cutting it. I, it wasn't included in this, but you're right. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Uh, Sander, any, any comments on Judy's uh, point? I'm sure Judy does this pretty much the way we do it because, you know, we, we do it the same way. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, the one thing that, uh, that we do all, almost always, and it, it's very rare for us to clip an aneurysm with ICG alone. Uh, sometimes I will. Um, but it's very rare. I, I think an intraoperative angiogram is really, really helpful. Um, it can show you things that you don't expect or see with the ICG. The ICG is good for, for confirming that blood vessels that you can see are open, but it's very hard to determine kind of the flow rate and, and, and things like that. So I don't know that that would have made any difference here, but sometimes that's, that's helpful. Um, I do, I do think that people who have an, uh, a drilling of their clinoid uh, have headaches. And I, I think that that is from the bone dust. And so we, we do a lot of effort to try to compartmentalize that drilling with uh, gel foam and try to wash it out really well. And then I do a very slow steroid taper um, as well, um, which seems to help. Um, but, I, but I have had an, a patient here or there um, with really chronic headaches that I thought was like, you know, a CSF leak or something. We can never document that. And finally they got better, but, but we, we, you can see that. And that is one of the advantages of the endovascular approach for this is that, that that's obviated. I will say they, there are, and this is not a good example, this one, but there are uh, cases where, um, you have somebody with, um, actual visual acuity problems from their ophthalmic aneurysm. And uh, even with a pipeline or um, with a, you know, a stent coiling, 
you're not decompressing that nerve. So you're not uh, unroofing it, removing the falciform ligament. And, um, and for those patients, I, I actually prefer to do a, a microsurgical thing if, if we're gonna try to, to actually uh, help the vision. Um, and I've seen people really in that setting where they've had an endovascular approach through no fault of the endovascular person, but the, just the thrombosis of the aneurysm has uh, worsened their, um, their, um, their vision um, acutely due to the thrombosis and the, and the lack of decompression of the nerve. So just something to keep in mind as a potential, uh, you know, rare case that you might want to pivot towards a microsurgical approach. Yeah. Judy, you know, one of the things I worry about when we, you end up putting two or three clips and I've, we've seen that. I mean, I, I certainly recall taking at least one patient back to the OR where kind of the optic nerve or the clip, the clip doesn't move, but you know how things resettle in a way that the clip can uh, indent or kink the nerve. I don't know, but yes. that's always at the back of my mind. Yes. When, well, I was very disappointed to have to use so many clips actually. Yeah. Really yeah, I was hoping for two at the max. Um, but That's right. Yeah, yeah, they take space. They take so much space. There. A lot of space. space there. Yeah. Yeah. And any of the panelists uh, have have a uh, Babak? Uh, hello, Babak, uh, and or Adel. Uh, any comments on on the case? In uh, yeah, I think this is uh, just a difficult kind of a you know checkmate either way you play it. Unfortunately. Um, I can easily see how, you know, putting the patient on um, dual antiplatelets and uh, an anticoagulant, you know, it doesn't take more than a small platelet plug and, uh, you know, over a period of time. I also think that um, we followed a few patients for five, six years, and uh, we've had a few cases where, you know, when the ophthalmic is drawing quite a bit of flow, um, as Felipe said, there will be a regression and actually the neck will narrow down, uh, but there will still be substantial kind of an aneurysmal pouch, um, which is kind of a little disappointing. And so in this particular patient, you know, being on dual antiplatelets and anticoagulation, that regression process may take that much longer. So um, I think uh, it was very reasonable to take the patient to surgery. Um, and obviously it's difficult to know because of the uh, need to stop the anticoagulation, you know, what, what uh, caused what, but at least her enters are secured. Uh, Ju uh, Judy, there is a question from the audience, uh, Dr. Farzana Tarek. Dr. Wang, you, do you think endoscopic assisted clipping would be the microneurosurgery junior? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so we, ha it's, uh, we have to get it to work. So yes, there are groups that are publishing very nice studies, uh, you know, to look around corners and so forth. I think that that's, that's uh, very promising, uh, but uh, you, you still need to know what you're looking for. And so I still think that really understanding the anatomy and really being able to understand angiographic anatomy and translating it into what you're seeing under the microscope uh, takes a lot of studying and, and really, you know, formulating your skills so that we don't uh, necessarily uh, rely um, too much on, on an extra tool or a new toy. But yes, certainly it's promising. Another question for you, Judy, from uh, again, Bernard Fennell. Do you routinely use micro Doppler? I assume during clipping. Right, right. Uh, we don't, we do use the ICG and the intraoperative angiography. Um, some, some, we, some, there are some instances, but I, I wouldn't say I necessarily do it routinely. Yeah, I, I, I use it quite a bit. I mean, yeah. I use both and I've, I use quant, not micro Doppler, but just quantitative flow measurements. And I've learned so much over the last 20 years I've been using them. Mm -hmm. You know, the ICG can be falsely encouraging. And yes, you, know, yes. you measure before you clip, then you measure, not in a sim, every simple aneurysm, but the more complicated ones, then you measure after you clip. And then it, it tells you so much information and if there's a significant drop in the flow, something, something, the clip needs to be readjusted. Okay, great case. Shows you what real life difficulty. Yes. Oh, sorry, Babak, you want, uh, you want to? Question for the group. If someone requires long-term anticoagulation, will that sway you away from flow diversion? 
No, I think the dual antiplatelet therapy, you know, is going to last three to six months, you know, and I think um, with uh, shorter acting, kind of faster onset off kind of uh, shorter half-life like Prestagrel and so on, um, I feel a bit more confident. You know, we do PRU testing, platelet function testing uh, on everybody, and you can actually dose that over time so that you're at the margin where you have enough platelet inhibition, so you can potentially be on uh, triple, um, you know, for a certain period of time. And I think you may be able to potentially wean off the dual antiplatelet earlier, maybe after a month or so, depending on the, you know, device, the amount of metal and so on. So I, I, I you know, I think that's how I would play it. Are there any concerns about uh, either durability or recant of flow diversion? There's been some suggestions that if you're on anticoagulation, you may even get reversal of an aneurysm that you thought was clotted anecdotally. Um, what, what I've seen in my hands is uh, when the dual antiplatelet inhibition, the, the platelet function is really poor, it will take much longer to actually have a flow diverter uh, cause involution of the aneurysm. Uh, not so much with the um, anticoagulant. I think the anticoagulant may play a role perhaps in some of those, um, you know, partially uh, kind of recanalized stent coiled aneurysm, but with flow diversion, uh, I think it, at least in my experience, you know, uh, it seems to be more of a platelet based. Uh, yeah, I agree. What do you think, uh, Felipe? Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, I, I wouldn't have a concern in this situation with that. Okay, Adil, how about uh, you go ahead with your case? Okay. Can you guys uh, see the uh, screen? Yeah, looks great. All right, so this is a 53-year-old woman who presents with uh, right-sided uh, headaches and underwent the CAT scan, which shows this uh, uh, calcified uh, area um, around her uh, right internal carotid. Um, contrast uh, MRI and uh, an MRA which uh, shows um, this uh, uh, looks like an IC aneurysm. So this is her angiogram and uh, you can see she has fibromuscular dysplasia in her neck um, and this uh, quite substantial uh, aneurysm of the um, kind of a ophthalmic segment of the carotid um, obviously more kind of was surely pointing, which is associated with a significant stenosis right proximal to the neck. This is kind of a quick view of it. Um, it's about 10 millimeters in depth, 7.6 uh, millimeters across and a neck of 4.7 millimeters. And I think this uh, 3D rotational angiography, obviously because of the way you can window it, seems to underestimate the uh, actual severity of the stenosis. Uh, Adel, where did, did you see the, is, did you see the PCOM artery? Uh, it's right here. Oh, that was, there you go. Sorry, I was looking at the other view. Okay, got it. So it's quite a, quite a bit. Uh, I, I think it's metrocroidal, and this is actually PCOM, and you're seeing flow in reverse. As a result, you're seeing undiluted flow of the PCOM right here. So this is peak common, I think it's anterocroidal, as you can see, following back. And so we're getting some retrograde flow from the posterior circulation. Again, highlighting the interesting um, importance of the stenosis. Oh, I see Bobby Stark. Bobby, you're with us. Great. Uh, do you mind? Can we ask Bobby what he would do first before we ask the speakers? Yeah, that's a tough one. You know, I'm, 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 as you know, anybody that has fibromuscular dysplasia, and I didn't see the whole carotid all the way down. You know, I'm a lot more nervous about endovascular approaches. And obviously she has that stenosis there. I don't, I think it's gonna be tough to treat this endovascularly with some sort of stent, if not stent and coils. Uh, one option would also be to consider doing a balloon occlusion test. I mean, this is distal to the ophthalmic and proximal to the anterocroidal. So you could consider doing a balloon occlusion test taking her for surgery, potentially clipping it. But if you had to, you could also trap it. Um, I'm a little bit less excited about it, flow diverting or flow diverting coils or stent coil, just because one, 
Is that part just calcified or is there a partially thrombosed element also? This is calcified here. There may be partially thrombosed component. And by the way, uh, regarding uh, taking down the kind of a deconstructive approach, she actually has a uh, smaller around five millimeter aneurysm you can see on the contralateral carotid. So in terms of increasing the flow, that would be a consideration. Yeah, and I guess, I mean, I guess I can't see that other aneurysm, but uh, a consideration also at clipping slash trapping would be looking across and potentially if, if is the contralateral one superior hypothesis or ophthalmic, potentially you could clip the right and the, and the contralateral one through a single approach. Actually, yeah, super hypothesis. But um, if it's partially thrombosed, I think I'm, I'm pretty unexcited about flow diverting stents alone. Usually if, if it's partially thrombosed, I like a stent coil or coils and a pipeline, but not too excited about pipeline and in this case where she's got fibromuscular muscular dysplasia and she's got a pretty significant stenosis just um, proximal. I think it's it's doable, but it might be a little bit lower on my list. I, I agree with you. This was uh, this um, stenosis here actually has partially some calcium. That's why you see it's a little hazy. Um, it's actually around a millimeter or less than a millimeter uh, or so. Um, and so, um, you know, the challenge obviously was the calcified component of it. Um, Sandra, what would you, uh, how would you approach this? Yeah, I'd, I'd be ducking this case. I'd be trying to uh, voice this off on Sean or Phil. Um, I don't like the calcium. I don't like the stenosis for surgery. It can be done, but I, but I, I don't really love it. Um, you know, you could, you could do a bypass and occlusion, but I don't, I don't love that for this patient either. So my feeling would be um, maybe pipeline's not the right thing, but what about <clears throat> what about a stent coiling? Yeah, that's an excellent point. That's, that's kind excellent. of what I, I would probably recommend. Yeah. You, you could say don't do anything, but it's a pretty big aneurysm. And yeah, she's been having headaches, and so that's kind of not good enough. I would, I would treat it. So I like stent coiling. You pick the stent. Okay. <laughs> Uh, can, can I ask, Felipe, I, uh, the early uh, reports of delayed hemorrhages of previously unruptured aneurysms when pipeline was used, uh, the one common factor, wasn't it, pre-aneurysmal stenosis like this one, and people talked about paradoxical rise in the intra-aneurysmal pressure after you deploy a flow diverter. Is that still the thinking, and would you, would you consider this, uh, the stenosis, uh, uh, well, uh, you tell me, relative or absolute contraindication to flow diverters? Yeah, I would, I would consider this a, a contraindication to, to flow diversion. And uh, Adel, you, you mentioned that that stenosis tapered down to one millimeter in size. Yeah. Around that. Yeah, that, and you, if that's truly the case when you get up there, then you'll, you, you may be occlusive just with your microcatheter crossing it. Um, which you'll see <laughs> with the control angiogram. But yeah, laying hardware through that segment, I think is, um, is potentially fraught with complication. Um, you could attempt to angioplasty and see if that gives a bit and, and opens the artery, but I, I doubt it would. Uh, and that is also you know, potentially associated with complications. I'm not sure what the overall advantage of stenting and coiling would be. Um, you're still laying hardware down through a uh, stenotic segment. So uh, it granted it's not as much uh, as a flow diverter, but it still is you know, compromising an, an already very compromised artery. Yeah, I think uh, you know, the causes of the intracerebral hemorrhage though, they weren't completely elucidated. That, that certainly was one association, um, the pre-aneurysmal uh, stenosis, which um, uh, you know, was exacerbated with placement of the device and, and altered the flow jet. Uh, we see far less of that than we do, uh, than we have in the past. I like Bobby's idea. I, th I think uh, taking this vessel down uh, should be a real consideration. Uh, balloon test occlusion certainly uh, should be done here. Um, you didn't show the contralateral side. I think you mentioned that she does have a patent ACOM at all. Um, yes, she, she, she does. Um, she does have a patent ACOM with a good, um, you know, anterior cerebral uh, yeah. good complex. So, uh, you know, 
you know, stenting and coiling, not, not just because of the hardware, but you're, you're going to be placing, you know, tons of coils in this aneurysm. I, and I, I think in all likelihood, you'll probably still have some residual filling of the aneurysm uh, after placing thousands of dollars worth, uh, worth yeah, of I mean, uh, um, and likely subject the patient to further, you know, coil compaction over time. So uh, I think a deconstructive approach here is, is uh, absolutely reasonable. Judy, would you like to uh, take a crack on your approach? Are you asking me or? I was just asking Judy if she wanted. Oh, oh okay. So, so uh, do we really think that coiling this aneurysm is going to cure her headaches? Um, so that's one question I had. Um, but uh, I, I understand the, uh, all the discussions and so forth, but I would not be uh, very likely to offer surgery, um, but I do think a balloon test occlusion is, is warranted, um, and I would definitely be trying hard to spare her craniotomy and hopefully uh, an endovascular approach of some kind, potentially vessel sacrifice. Okay, great. So, you know, looking, looking at this um, from kind of exactly um, what Felipe was talking about, you know, you kind of have to look and see what a potential stent, you know, how is it going to lie and uh, what kind of stent do we have that can negotiate this type of turn. Um, and, you know, the truth is anything like a braided stent, like the Elvis uh, stent, would probably um, compress and would cramp at this point. Um, and, um, an atlas stand probably will actually bulge into the uh, lumen uh, and also pose, you know, in a small, when it's kind of really small diameter, uh, difficulty for subsequent navigation. So um, the approach, um, as you can see here, you can see the um, kind of uh, dilution of the uh, contrast from the contralateral from the ACOM. So we know the ACOM and the PCOM. Um, the initial approach here uh, was to try stent coiling. Um, and uh, basically it was a dual microcatheter. And the idea was to, it was actually quite difficult to navigate even to get into the distal ICA. Um, and uh, to provide this as a um, potential stent in case we need it. Um, and then to actually coil as much as possible, the dome um, was uh, kind of a 3D construct. You can see the coil mass. And at this point, prior to deploying the uh, Atlas stent, which I kind of I thought would be one option, I really felt that that was not really going to provide a long-term uh, solution for this patient. And uh, actually uh, switch strategies, um, you know, um, and again, I kind of thought about what kind of fluid diverter I'd be able to use in this case. Uh, but we actually switched strategies to use a uh, flow diverter. Um, and um, you can see the diameter is about 0.91 millimeters, um, approximately around 3.2. So we actually, um, you can see the microcatheter for the pipeline. We're able to get the pipeline distally. And um, you can see here that we have the pipeline deployed successfully. And um, you can see a number of features here. It's not completely opposed here. It's not completely opposed here either. It's crimped here and very minor um, for opposition proximal, which is uh, kind of minor uh, compared to everything else. At this point, the angiography really showed that the neck of the aneurysm was still filling dramatically. And so we started with the balloon angioplasty here as a um, high performed balloon that we tried to just uh, tag the proximal portion. Uh, then we were kind of not able to navigate that through the stenosis. We tried with a hyperglide balloon and also were not able to navigate through that stenosis. Um, so actually I, I used a, a one and a half millimeter coronary balloon uh, and after on multiple tries we were able to get it intraluminally. I uh, was able to dilate the stenosis enough to then get a three millimeter coronary angioplasty balloon. Uh, and this is again a non-compliant balloon um, and was able to uh, dilate that segment. Uh, and this is kind of the final result that we got. 
we get an MRI on all of our patients after any embolization procedure looking for DWI and also getting an MR baseline. And this is her uh, post up day one MR. You can see it's quite a bit of filling in the aneurysm. Uh, prior to the angioplasty, it seemed like our treatment increased the filling uh, in the neck region. So I was actually quite worried and we brought her back early. Um, and it looked like she actually responded reasonably well at two months. Uh, we can see the still preservation of the lumen of the ICA and less filling in the region of the neck. This is our three month angiogram. Um, and we can see that uh, uh, the ICA is still open and uh, we've got some um, kind of nice response. The vessel has remodeled both in its shape and the lumen itself. Um, and there's been uh, Kind of preservation of the ophthalmic. And if you take a look at uh, the changes in the vessel shape, um, you can see that the vessel, uh, that kink there is kind of straightened out. You know, it's kind of more straight. Um, and you can actually see the, I don't know if you can see that white band right there. It's quite a bit of intimal hyperplasia all across the stent, which is probably one of the mechanism of these um, fluid diverters actually really preventing recanalization. Um, and kind of forming a tissue band. Sorry, yeah, so this is, she's done very well. Her headaches um, uh, improved slowly after about a month and uh, now she's headache free. Um, and right now we're just waiting um, to kind of have this instant stenosis or entomopoplasia type of uh, stabilize. Um, we've seen that quite a bit in younger, um, patients, and so we're going to wait a little bit longer before addressing the contralateral aneurysm. Good result, Adil. Any comments from the panelists or speakers? Well, that, it's, uh, that is a great result, Adil. I congratulate you on that. I'm, I'm Frankly, I'm a bit surprised that the angioplasty worked. I, I applaud your, your uh, you you switching from the compliant balloon to the to the coronary balloon. I think that was really, really the uh, the best option in this case, and, and probably generated enough radial force to to open that. Um, it it really, in my mind, um, was more. It appears more from a twist in the artery below the aneurysm rather than an atherosclerotic narrowing, which I think would have been uh, more more uh, worrisome. So um, yeah, this, this looks good. Yeah, thank you. It was kind of, uh, you know, um, after deploying the uh, pipeline and spending 10, 15 minutes trying to get through that, you know, the stenosis with the coronary balloon, you kind of uh, uh, obviously are thinking maybe this wasn't the right decision, but luckily it worked out. Adel, remind me, did you have a BTO prior to this? Uh, we did not. We did not have a BTO. And in retrospect, uh, I probably should have. Uh, he kind of was a bit uh, overconfident on her, uh, it's on her angiographic uh, study, but uh, that should have been done. How did you feel taking a three millimeter coronary balloon there and inflating it? Well, I mean, you know, we, um, it's a pretty proximal segment of the carotid and, you know, we uh, during my training uh, back in the 90s, we <laughs> we, we kind of uh, did that uh, somewhat for intracranial atherosclerosis. That was actually our good. Exactly. But at the neck of an aneurysm, it's a little disconcerting. So congratulations. Did, did you sort of have a mental plan B if you had a rupture at that point? Um, I mean, there are so many ways you can deal with the rupture, right? In that area would you'd have to reverse the heparin, obviously, and platelets, and then shut down the vessel, identify the rupture site. You're yeah. thinking the pipeline has sort of trapped you at that point from any extra access to the aneurysm. So it would be really a shutdown, no? Correct. So, I mean, presumably the rupture would be more from the neck region rather than, you know, from the uh, dome itself. Impressive. Thank you. Yeah, it's a really nice case, uh, Dr. Malik. I guess for the, for the other, you know, and maybe more junior people watching, I mean, I think it's, it's nice that you could use a, a non-compliant balloon in that segment, probably because it's right up against the bone. And just for the people that are, you know, regularly using pipeline in other segments where it's, where it's not up against the bone, obviously you need to be super careful. If you've got an atherosclerotic stenosis, 
with with the pipeline inside, you have to be super careful with your angioplasty, especially if you've got a, a non-compliant balloon. But uh, nice work. Okay, uh, uh, um, Adil, we're running a little out of time, so I'm I, I'm sorry, I don't have time for your other multiple cases. So I, I, I'm going to ask Babak to, to 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 go next, and uh, Sander may have to leave us. He has another Zoom. So Babak, can I invite you to share your slides? You're muted. Okay, let me share the screen. I try to prepare two to appeal to our two guest speakers. Let me make sure this works. Let me know if this is coming through. Yes. OK. Um, uh, fairly quickly, this is a, a young patient in her early 30s. Um, and she is trying to have children. Uh, and she has a seizure, uh, and this is discovered. She's essentially intact. Um, okay, uh, you, uh, I guess Felipe too has to go to the ABNS board. Felipe, you have time to give your opinion and then leave us? Or you sure, there's only three slides, so I'll just make it super quick. Okay. This one, this one, this one, that's it. Unruptured giant MCA aneurysm, young woman. Here's the relevant MR cuts. Here's AP lateral, and here's a selected view. How yeah. about that? forcing you to make a decision on the fly, like life every day? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and Babak, you said she was in her thirties. Correct, early thirties. Yeah. Um, in this case, I, I think I really would favor surgical uh, ligation of this aneurysm. Um, I think you're dealing with a partially thrombosed aneurysm in a young woman. Your, your placement of a flow diverter, which I think is, is the best option here, at least I think the best endovascular option, really entails uh, making a 180 degree turn and deploying the device. We know these devices are, are flexible and, and, and can do that, but I, I just, I, I don't think it's a great option here. Um, I think I would favor more of a, um, a definitive surgical reconstruction and, and debulking of the, of the mass of the aneurysm rather than, than laying hardware down through that. Got it. It's feasible, um, but I don't think it's ideal. Sander, your thoughts? Uh, uh, Sander had to leave. You know, they have oh. a BNS board meeting. Actually, okay. Felipe, Judy, and Sander, I think, have to leave. So, so we will fast forward through this. Jacques, your call. Yeah, no, uh, no, surgery, you know, with potential bypass. I'll have to study the neck. Uh, no, no, fast. Oh, sorry. You mean, no, no, we can keep talking, the rest of us, that's okay. Ah, okay. So um, we can fast forward through this. I'll toss one last case. Jacques, what would you do? You can pinch in for Sander. Yeah, no, that's what I said. I, I do, I consider uh, exploration and bypass, whether it's double barrel bypass, I'll study what branches come out of the aneurysm, see how many we have to take care of. Uh, that's what I would do, young woman, for sure. Okay, fair enough. Um, our thoughts were the same. Um, our group considered putting a flow diversion stent. Uh, we weren't comfortable with the um, the turn we thought we could get away with, but the landing zone was pretty short because it bifurcates pretty quickly here. We weren't even sure if this was a normal segment. So we thought we'd end up trapping one of the M2, M3 divisions of this M2. Uh, so as you mentioned, we chose surgical exploration. Um, she has a pretty decent STA, so we harvested that. Um, We'll quickly fast forward through this long story short. Um, the entire aneurysm is really dug under the temporal lobe. You can see an inflow and an outflow to the aneurysm. And again, in the interest of time, we'll just jump forward. And so there's an inflow through here, an outflow. Uh, and this is not, I will apologize, well edited, but we'll jump a bit forward. And so we decided we would just trap and bypass it. We took a long segment of the SDA. And 
we only temporarily occluded one of the M3s, so that that allowed us to have no issues with ischemia because uh, the outflow zone came out of the aneurysm and then rapidly bifurcated into two M3s. So we just bypassed it to one of the M3s. So that's all that's temporarily occluded. Uh, let's jump forward. And now this is inflow into the aneurysm and we just decided not to explore or waste any time with it. We just trapped the inflow and this is the outflow coming out of it. So the whole aneurysm is really at the bottom uh, uh, quarter of the screen and we just put the fissure over it. We didn't bother chasing the rest of it. Um, so you mean uh, you mean you trap you bypassed and trapped the aneurysm proximal yes. aneurysm? Yeah. Okay. Correct. So here's the IC green. Here's the STA coming in. Uh, there's there the two branches. There is a delay in the video, uh, Babak. Uh, yeah, now we see the ICG. Uh, right. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Got it. Okay. And here's the graft. Um, I'll just skip forward. So basically, um, we've got the superior M2 native. This was a giant aneurysm arising from the inferior M2. So we left the superior M2 as is. Uh, and you can see, and then we took this guy and it basically becomes a large sort of uh, inferior M2 temporal uh, occipital artery. And so if you kind of look at them, we've this is native. And then this segment of the MCA used to be the aneurysm, and it's now supplied by the uh, STMC graph. So you can kind of overlap them. So that's what we chose. Um, I'll give you guys one other case with a different bend, perhaps. Perfect. Right, nice case, uh, Babak. Did you, you measure flow with the flow probe before you do? Uh... I should have. I'm going to be embarrassed. I didn't have one available, but that was a good point. I did leave her temporarily occluded for 30 minutes with SSCP, MEPs, and EEG. None of those showed a change, but you're absolutely right. I think I, measuring true flow would have made more sense. Um, let's do one quick different one. And I suspect we gotta hit the share. Is this sharing? Can yeah. you see the screen or no? You are? Yeah, we're seeing, it says unruptured basilar. Yes, okay. Um, this is a lady in her late 60s who's a vascular path. Um, you name a risk factor, she has it. And she's found to have an incidental about nine-ish millimeter basilar tip aneurysm. Um, we took her for diagnostic angiography and there's a point to showing this. This is the only good picture I could get on the diagnostic angiogram as you'll see why. Um, so right internal injection, um, there's a big PCOM going back, PCA. It does fill the aneurysm on the way. Um, the rest of the time was uh, full of grief. Um, this is her uh, subclavian and her arch is not fun. Um, this is basically a wire just to maintain catheter stability so we can inject something. This is the left vert. And it turns out this is severe subclavian stenosis. So when you inject her left vert, she has immediate steel going down the other side. This is as good a picture as I could get injecting hard into the left vert. It just won't fill the aneurysm. Um, so I embarrassingly hung my uh, tail between my legs and went back to the MRA and tried to do some reconstructions. And so here's what the aneurysm looks like on the MRA. Um, there's Adel. Your oh, there's go a ahead. stenosis there. So Adel, how would you handle aneurysms that you cannot access endovascularly with catheters? Actually, Bobby and I dealt with a similar, very similar issue like two weeks ago, very difficult to even access there. Yeah, one, one option here is uh, to potentially um, come across the PCOM with a kind of a stent across the neck of the aneurysm and then uh, coil of the aneurysm by using maybe a radial approach through the uh, left uh, vertebral artery. <clears throat> um, that's kind of one approach. Do, we, do you have any imaging earlier uh, in terms of uh, whether uh, this aneurysm ha has been there before or is it treating itself? First time, first time that showed up. So honestly, I don't have any follow-up on this. I mean, prior 
to uh, these pictures. Yeah. That, uh, that probably would be my thought is, you know, you showed a PCOM from the uh, right injection. Um, and so uh, I would try to carefully see if you can go across with a very low profile, um, maybe neuroform atlas stent using a duo kind of a 0165 microcatheter and then um, either do it in a stage fashion or maybe have uh, come through the left vertebral artery, again, with a very um, low profile microcatheter, obviously gonna have very tenuous, um, uh, very tenuous uh, support. So that's probably the approach I would suggest rather than anything more sturdy, you know, in terms of reaching it within, for an endovascular approach. I think obviously a surgical approach with all of our risk factors and our subclavian steel, um, kind of a difficult option for her. Jacques, what are your thoughts? What would you do? Yeah. Um, she's 69, you said? Yeah, late 60s, correct. Late 60s. Um, I would look, I mean, you know, I mean, again, Bobby and I had a very similar case uh, that I would have loved to be you know, treatable endovascularly, very difficult access. I actually explored surgically and backed out because <laughs> of the heavy calcification at the base. But uh, I don't remember if we know calcification. Uh, do we know if it's heavy? No, no, no. I had a CTA and minimal cal. No, okay. no calcification. Well, I should have put the pictures. Yeah, I, I would clip it. Now, uh, I don't, I can't tell you the approach because I need to have an idea where it is in relation to the posterior yeah. clinoid. Um, you know, subtemporal versus transylvian plus or minus transcavernous, but I would clip it given the endovascular difficulties, yes. Um, so uh, we looked at uh, these options. Our concern was that she was a bit of a vascular path and uh, I was a bit reluctant to want to do anything open on her. Um, when we looked at these images, we thought that uh, the left vert is tortuous, but the right vert isn't horrific. And so we thought, well, why don't we just go radial? And I already know Bobby's been probably thinking about that the second he saw these cases and wondering what is a femoral artery. Um, so uh, we went transradial from the right side and there's our guide catheter. And uh, now you have a better neck view. Um, so finally we can actually see it properly. Um, let me see, do I have a, and I have a 3D, okay. So uh, are there thoughts at this point? Bobby, what would you do? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's, I agree, you know, ni nice case for, I think, an endovascular approach. And I agree, I'd probably come from the right. There's a big PCOM. So you could come from PCOM across the uh, P1 to P2, or sorry, contralateral P1, probably with a stent, and then come probably radially uh, with the second system from the vert and coil. And I'd probably, like Dr. Malik said, probably use an atlas across the base. You get nice reconstruction of the base. The um, um, vessel is somewhat tortuous and, um, you know, um, I would try to use like a, maybe no more of an open cell stent so that you can get better opposition rather than like a braided stent or, um, you know, but I'm, I'm, it's possible those may work as well. I, you know, I find that sometimes, even though the CAT scan does not detect uh, calcium, uh, if you do a negative, uh, just a cone beam CT, uh, it may actually be a little more sensitive to, to picking up calcifications in the wall um, that, that may be missed on a regular, you know, kind of a local uh, CT without injecting any contrast, actually. Um, so we really like these ideas. The one concern we had was that... Uh, uh, I'm so sorry. I had a picture of the arch. My mistake. She's got a terrible type three arch. Um, we can get a sense of the struggle here just to maintain stability to get a injection. Uh, and again, we could certainly toss a balloon here and climb up it, but I wasn't really keen on having catheters and anterior and posterior circulation. Um, so I sort of checked in that and thought, what is the simplest thing I can do just transradial, not doing anything fancy with one guy catheter. And, and I'm sure there are way more elegant ways of doing this. Uh, but we thought, why don't we just convert this into a sidewall aneurysm? She's got a huge PCOM. She has no need for that P1 segment. So who cares? And so our plan was to basically take a stent from the basilar into what needs to be protected, the left uh, 
P1 and then just coil this to completion. So in this case, we'll be protecting the SCAs, protecting the left P1, and we had no qualms about losing the origin of that because her P column was ginormous, um, just for simplicity's sake. Um, and so it, you would think this angle is easy. Uh, I thought this would be a piece of cake and nope. So we actually ended up having to go around the donor of the aneurysm to finally get enough wire that you could actually get a catheter and get enough purchase. Long and short of it, we use the atlas stent. So the, here's the proximal stent, here's the distal stent, here's the coil. Um, and here's the final uh, construct. As you can see, the P1 segment is about to go. Um, and this, I've seen her in three month follow-up. Uh, so it's only short-term follow-up. Uh, she looks fantastic. The MR shows no recurrence at this point, but obviously we know that wide neck aneurysms just with uh, stent and coiling do have a recan rate. Um, we also thought that while we're there, let's just fix the subclavian stenosis. And so uh, this is a, 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 the stent put across and we managed to avoid falling into the innominate. And so now she has equal radial pulses and no longer has this uh, activity induced tingling in her hand. Nice job. Very nice. Well, um, it's 7.15, very exciting, two hours, 15 minutes. Thank you. Sorry, we lost some of our speakers to another Zoom, but the audience loved it, stayed with us till the end. Thank you very much, and I bid you a good evening.